Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Providence Money Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Isaac, Client Advisor at Providence. Today's episode is the second chapter of our mini-series titled The Story of Our Client's Wealth Journey. In our previous episode, we talked about our, who our clients typically are, their concerns, and their need for a trusted advisor. To them, finding an advisor is easy. But finding an advisor that they can trust, who would guide them to make the best decisions best wealth decisions for themselves is difficult. Even though the role that wealth advisors play is arguably as important as other professional services, such as of uh, those of the legal or medical field, there's significantly less trust in the financial advisory space. In this episode, we will explore why this is so. Join me today is Evelyn Go, Deputy CEO and Chief Advisory Officer here at Provident. Hi Evelyn, great to have you here today. Thank you for having me. So Evelyn, from your experience being in the industry for more than two decades, what are some issues, what are some common issues that our clients face when searching for a trusted advisor? I think first and foremost, we want to recognize that, you know, money is a very personal topic. So um, not many of us are actually comfortable discussing our personal finances uh, with other people. So when we take that step, of uh, getting someone to plan for us. Ideally, we want someone who is uh, able to do it comprehensively so that mm. I don't have to go to different places, right? Yeah. So I would say, yeah, one of the challenge will be uh, finding an advisor who is able to advise you comprehensive, comprehensively because the, actually wealth advisory uh, spans over many different uh, aspects, right? right? Uh, and to be able to have that expertise, you know, and a competency, to um, guide you in all these different aspects is another challenge. So we have um, comprehensiveness, the challenge of comprehensiveness, the challenge of competency. And then, of course, when I look for an advisor, I want to ensure that, hey, this advisor will be around for a long time, right? Because I, I think I'll be around for a long time and my financial plan uh, should be like that as well. Uh, and therefore, that uh, concern of like, you know, where this uh, individual be around, okay? But if the individual cannot be around for a uh, you know, or at least there is no guarantee that he will outlive me and all that, then I look for a firm. But looking for a firm, there is that concern of like, okay, consistency of advice, okay, across the different advisors there. And you, you mentioned about trusted advisor, okay. So that thing is um, the concern of whatever that's recommended to me, is it, uh, you know, for my best interest or is it because of uh, the amount of money that they can, the advisor can earn? Uh, through the product that they introduce. So uh, one big challenge is the conflict of interest. So to summarize, uh, in terms of like um, the challenges, uh, that is very real. Um, you can remember in uh, four Cs, Singaporeans like Cs, right? Yeah. Right. So you have that uh, four Cs of uh, conflict of interest, uh, comprehensiveness, competency, uh, consistency, and continuity of advice. Right. Thanks, Evelyn. So let's dive deeper into these four points that you have raised. As you know, most advisors in Singapore um, is still operating on a commission-based model. Mm. So to all our listeners, you can refer to Season 3, Episode 3 of this podcast for more information on how advisors are compensated in Singapore. So how does this model typically lead to conflict of interest? Well, I mean, if you talk about compensation, it's always... Uh, or conflict of interest is always a very sensitive uh, topic. So yeah. I think first things first, we just want to you know emphasize that we are not saying that all commissions taking advisors are bad. You know, uh, I'm sure there are uh, commissions taking advisors out there who sincerely and truly wants to do what's best uh, for the clients. But having said that, um, we can't run away from the fact that compensation drives behavior, mm. right? Um, how I'm paid, uh, does actually, in a way, influence how I conduct my work. So if today, how much I can bring back home every month uh, is actually directly uh, influenced or uh, related to uh, the number or the type of uh, products that I sell, uh, I'm sure that it will present a certain level uh, of conflict of interest. Um, and it doesn't help that, um, you know, the bulk of the financial products uh, in Singapore actually pay huge commissions. Um, and oftentimes, clients do need to implement uh, certain uh, financial 
products as part of their solutions. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that would be uh, a concern. And even if the advisor is very sincere, very competent, I think you can't stop the client from having that bugging question, right? Mm -hmm. The temptation is always there. Yeah, and then that that, that worry or that concern of a client uh, that, um, you know, is this product recommended because it works for me? Uh, most suitable for me or is it because it pays a big commission? Right, so in the back of the client's mind, there's always reservations whether the recommendation that is given to them uh, is in their best interest or not. Yeah, I, I think in big ways or small ways, la, I'm sure that there is a certain tint of that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, as a consumer, we always want to ask ourselves, is this the best for us? Mm-hmm. Especially, you know, uh, when wealth advisory, financial planning is actually a very big thing. Right. So let's talk about comprehensiveness of a wealth plan. So in your opinion, you know, when we say comprehensiveness of a wealth plan, a uh, comprehensive wealth plan, how should it look like? What, what is a comprehensive wealth plan? Well, I think if we want to talk about comprehensive uh, wealth plan, uh, it has to cover the different aspects okay, of wealth planning, uh, which is in the area of um, protection, uh, in the area of accumulation or drawdown, depending on which phase of life the client is in, uh, and uh, end-of-life issues, because you have to ensure that your wealth uh, can be transferred uh, and preserved and um, you know distributed to uh, your intended beneficiaries. Um, but that's just the different pillars, right? To ensure that it's a solid wealth plan, you want to ensure that uh, it really meets the needs of the client, Right, so um, I know that's a lot. To un- uh, a lot of uh, stuff, you know, in one sentence. Uh, so allow me to unpack mm. uh, the different elements uh, of it. Um, I think to have a good wealth plan, the foundation must be uh, from that standpoint of um, what is it that is important to the client. What does the living uh, the best life look like to the client? So it involves um, taking time to sit down. Uh, to ask good questions, to really find out uh, from the client um, what's their their concerns, what's their needs, uh, and then from there understand um, what is their uh, cash flow requirements to support them to live uh, their best life, not just now, but also many years down the road. Yeah, Um, And there are life life risks that um, we cannot control, Mm. such as premature death, disability, or a major illness that can derail a plan. Right, the real client's uh, uh, plan. So then that's where um, you need to look into the protection part of things to actually um, look into, you know, uh, analyzing what are the gaps. Okay? And oftentimes it requires uh, insurance products. Then the other part is about the accumulation, right? Um, we all have uh, needs, right? But we have limited resources, mm. right? So then there is that uh, implications, Two implications is that, right, I want to keep my expenses as low as I can, right? And one uh, um, uh, expense is in the area of, uh, just now we talk about protection, right? Insurance premiums, right? So ideally, we should keep the protection expenses as low as possible. So being able to plan comprehensively allows us to look at, you know. The uh, different trade-offs. Yes, that's right. You know, so it's like maybe instead of multiple policies, you can uh, look at maybe one or two policies because in insurance, there's this thing called uh, large sum assured, right? Mm-hmm. So you can cover multiple needs with one or two uh, policies. You The type of uh, policies will also affect your premiums. So choosing uh, to use term plan, term policies versus whole life plans okay, will allow uh, the, uh, us to keep the expenses low so that you can have more resources, right, to go towards accumulation. Yeah, and then uh, as we continue on the, the accumulation uh, plans, uh, everyone would have like uh, life events that they need to plan for, they mm. need to provide for. Uh, and because of uh, limited resources, yeah. okay, it means that the other implication is that it means that we have to invest. Most of us will need to invest to make our monies uh, work harder. But there are so many different ways of investing. How do I know uh, what's the best way? Uh, does it mean that I need to maximize my uh, returns? But maximizing returns means it comes with a lot of risk, mm. right? Then that comes back to what are we mm. investing for, all right? So what are the life events uh, that we are talking about? We are talking about our own retirement, providing for our kids' tertiary education. And these are events where 
you know, when the time calls for it, I uh, I would prefer that the money is there, mm-hmm. right? So that means a key criteria is uh, I would like it. I like the investment strategy to uh, give me a high certainty that over time I'll get enough returns. Uh, and it is investing in a way that I'll be comfortable staying invested. Yeah. Right. So these are the various things that you need to consider uh, in the area of um, uh, accumulation um, investing. Um, and the other part of things uh, of comprehensive uh, plan is that life is transient. Okay. My boss always like to say we don't have a contract with God. So what that means is we don't know when we'll die. We don't know whether we'll lose mental capacity. And therefore, a comprehensive wealth plan will also require us to look into end-of-life matters, such as uh, getting our will done, uh, CPF nominations, uh, lasting power attorney, advanced care planning, uh, so on and so forth. Okay. And on a related note, because life is not static, right? things happen, things change, life happens. Okay. And therefore, no wealth plan is cast in stone. Right? So even after a very good, excellent wealth plan is being drawn up, Okay, there is still a need to uh, for regular review. Okay, sit down with the client to see what has changed in their life situations has changed, their desires have changed, and then we need to make changes uh, as and when necessary when there are major market turbulence. Right, the advisor needs to be there uh, to guide the client, to assure the client so that uh, they, we don't make uh, emotional decisions that will negatively impact our financial plan. Hi listeners, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Some long-time listeners might know that the inspiration behind this entire podcast was our CEO Chris's book titled Money Wisdom, Simple Truths for Financial Wellness. If you're interested in getting your own signed copy, please check out the link in the show notes for more information. Thank you and let's get back to the episode. So, yeah, that's a very good point that you raised because every time when we talk about a comprehensive wealth plan, um, people might think that, oh, it's this plan, uh, we plan in a way that, we, that this plan will never fail, mm. right? But actually, we acknowledge that, you know, sometimes uh, life can throw us some curveballs that we don't expect. So the part that you raised on uh, having a regular review is really very important. Yep. Yep. Right, so thanks Yves for the detailed answer. Um, it's not an easy answer to, yeah, uh, it's not an easy question <laughs> because, you know, uh, what is a comprehensive wealth plan? Essentially, I just you have to list down a lot of things that we do uh, for our clients. So some of our clients share that, um, you know, it's, a very diffi- it's very difficult to find a competent advisor that can um, do up this comprehensive wealth plan for them. Which ties into another point that you brought up earlier about competency. So why do you think this is so? I think first and foremost, you know, um, just now when we talk about the uh, comprehensive wealth plan, there is like so many different areas. So actually, if you think about it, it's like um, there is a wide range of uh, expertise that's needed, um, covering from protection to investments, you know, to estate planning, legacy planning. Uh, and I think it's impossible for a single advisor to be able to, you know, know all of this and still have time to prospect for business, advise clients, you know, uh, manage the client relationship on an ongoing basis. So to be fair, I think it's not a job of a single advisor, but uh, an entire team of uh, different specialists working together to support the advisor. And another point is also, you know, that um, if you look at the type of work that is required, right, that goes in into advising, a, ensuring a comprehensive well plan, you know, ongoing advice and all that. Uh, it's a lot of work. And part of the, the uh, work involved, uh, you know, such as taking time to really ask good questions, to find out what's important to a client, what living a good life looks like, uh, even the estate uh, planning, the end of life uh, uh, planning part of things, uh, actually does not uh, you know end up with um, impl- you know the implement implementation of uh, maybe financial instruments. So depending on the revenue model, the compensation uh, compensation model uh, of the advisor, it might not make economic sense to spend so much t- uh, time dwelling on this. Yeah, I mean the. I mean, just insurance alone. There's so many changes every year. Yes. Right? In terms of investments, uh, there's um, many instruments that become available uh, in Singapore. Just one example. Um, mm. 
you know so um yeah i think you know having a uh, specialist within all these different segments is is a lot better because like you mentioned it's virtually impossible for one person to be an expert on everything and not need just be an expert in everything but to be kept up to date with all the changes exactly yeah and at the same time you know like you mentioned uh, having to still um, you know generate new business get more leads you know and prospect for new clients uh. yeah and we are not working 24/7 right yeah. we also have our own family we also have our own uh, you know life to live yeah so yeah. it's just not possible So um lastly let's talk about consistency of advice. So why is consistency of advice so important? I think before we go into answering this question of consistency, uh I think it's important to actually um ask that question of what's the guiding principles uh of the advisor in the in the way he um analyze you know in these uh in him coming out with the recommendation so in other words what's the basis of his analysis and his recommendations um As an example, we have all heard about the phrase "buy term, invest the rest." Mm. Have we understand why is it so? What is the thought process? What's the philosophy uh, behind it? Um, if today I go and see a doctor and doctor tell me that oh you have uh, this and this condition, uh, I'm sure he didn't just kind of like look at me one look and then it's like he somehow got the diagnosis. Mm. Uh, usually, it's because he has sent me to do some test. Right, uh, some examinations, and the outcome of it uh, shows that a eh, that is uh, you know it, it is to conclude that there is a condition. Yeah. Um, so medical science has in a medical field that is established um, medical principles, right? And likewise, when he prescribe a um, treatment, right, there's always a basis. Mm. So in a similar vein, um, from For wealth advisory, it's very important to have uh, philosophies, to have uh, guiding principles, okay? Because that's the way uh, in which we ensure that you know the uh, there is a proper thought process, right? There is the uh, proper guidance in terms of uh, how analysis is done, how recommendations uh, are done, and clients will then have that peace of mind, right? Mm. Okay, that his wealth plan is well thought out. Okay, the analysis is very robust. Okay, and the recommendations is very sound. Right, so that leads us nicely then to this uh, question of uh, consistency, because if a firm has a consistent approach to providing uh, wealth advisory, then the client knows that hey, if I present the same set of information to two different advisors in the same firm, they can be assured that the analysis, the recommendations will be the same. And why mm. is that important? Just now we talk about you know. Uh, That concern that hey my advisor may not outlive me mm. because it's true, right? Um, because the advisor may retire at some point, will retire at some point, or cannot continue working because of a health condition. Yeah, and in yeah. this industry, a lot of people, uh, you know, the turnover is quite high. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. true. Yeah, definitely true. So that's where you know when um, if the firm has a consistent approach to uh, providing advice, mm. then the client would have the assurance uh, that. The advisor, the new advisor, who the lead advisor who is taking over, who has been assigned to take over, uh, we have no problem transiting because the the way advice is being done, okay, is actually consistent within the firm. So right. that provides continuity mm-hmm. of advice. That's why to me, consistency and continuity actually is interlinked. Right. So if the new advisor takes over, he will understand the plan you know, mm. because the in terms of methodology. Uh, planning assumptions, you know, is something that is consistent within the firm. Yeah, imagine if it's not consistent, then what? Have to redo the whole thing. The client has to go through the whole exercise, yeah. right? And then t- uh, it's a it's a major overhaul, like, essentially. Yeah, and if you have different num planning numbers, for example, you know, in terms of your asset allocation, mm. the resource allocation, everything will have to change. Yeah, all one. So I think the client solved. will be like, also, oh, eh, <laughs> what's the difference? Ah, uh? how come so different? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thanks for sharing, Evelyn. So, given the prevalence of the issues that we have discussed, um, how has the financial advisory industry in Singapore not only managed to survive but thrive despite wow. all this? Okay, that's a very good question. But one that is, um, I think, very tough uh, to answer. Um, I think it's been often times said, right, that uh, financial products are sold and not bought. Hmm. Actually, how many of us, as we think back on the very first insurance policies, 
uh, that we 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 uh, we have. Um, we actually did research. We actually go Google, look at you know uh, what should I be looking out for, what kind of plan is suitable, how do I assess uh, my needs. Uh, I think it's more like someone we know come and approach us, whether it's a friend, a relative, you know, come and approach us, and then we will sort a uh, product. Mm. So unfortunately, you know, despite uh, things that uh, the regulators try to introduce, uh, industry reviews and all that over the past two decades, uh, the industry, the financial industry in Singapore is still very much uh, still sales driven. And, it, uh, and I think generally consumers are still not uh, aware uh, or they do not know uh, what good advice looks like. Uh, this is despite regulators you know, spending a lot of time and effort uh, trying to improve the level of financial literacy. And uh, of course, over the past decade, especially, we saw uh, the proliferation of a lot of financial bloggers. Mm. But I think we can all agree that uh, uh, the vast majority of consumers um, still do not know um, that it is important, right, to seek out advisors that address the challenges of conflict of interest, you know, uh, looking out for uh, whether they are able to do a comprehensive uh, advice, whether they are competent enough to do it, and whether the way advice is being uh, delivered is consistent uh, and um, uh, have continuity. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't help that with social media and all that, everybody's marketing themselves as very competent as, uh, you know, being able to do a very comprehensive uh, job. But we all know that the test of the pudding is in the eating. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of people still uh, think of financial advisors as um, product peddlers, like just selling a, a, a product. Uh, and that reminds me of uh, an encounter uh, I had when uh, Provident first started. So I was having this exploratory session with a couple uh, and I noticed that, uh, you know, the husband uh, looks very guarded because the, his body language is um, such that... Yeah, <laughs> defensive. He's like, his arms are folded and, you know, he got this face that he's like uh, quite critical. Uh. Yeah. yeah, but anyway, I just do my part in uh, sharing about, um, you know, what Provident does, uh, our services, uh, but more importantly, why we do what we do. Uh, how we are compensated, how you know we address this uh, big elephant in the room of uh, conflict of interest by not taking any commissions at all, uh, that we are uh, fee only, we only charge a fee, our clients are only paymaster. And as I share that, I can observe that his guard just come down and he then shared with me that um, he insisted in coming along when he heard that the wife is meeting a financial advisor. I mean, of course, 20 years, 20, 20 25 years ago, you know, uh, yeah, we, we call ourselves financial advisors, right? So when he heard that the wife is uh, meeting a financial advisor, he insisted that he'll come along because he don't want the wife to be sold uh, insurance policies. Um, but after hearing uh, what we do at Provident, uh, he's perfectly happy uh, to engage us. Uh, in fact, he's so sold on our cause that his main concern actually is whether we'll survive. <laughs> yeah, so one of our events, he actually raised his hand during Q&A, you know, and he asked us what is our uh, vision, what is our growth plan uh, for the next 5, 10, uh, 15 years. Um, but I'm very happy to say that uh, Provident is doing well as a firm uh, and this couple has been a happy client for more than 20 years now. Yeah, thanks for sharing the story. It's very heartening to hear. Uh, you know, I mean, there are been many people that come in. You know, sometimes they are a bit skeptical, but you know, after going through our process, um, you know, they feel like they are not not skeptical. They become advocates as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so I hope that through this um, episode, people will really come to realize the core problems uh, with this industry, and in turn, know how to be aware of um, you know how to get good advice. If all these problems are mitigated, uh, people will, consumers will have an easier time finding a trusted advisor. And um, yeah, so hopefully uh, the industry in Singapore, the landscape would really change and you know, people in Singapore can get better advice. Mm. Yeah. So thank you so much, Evelyn, for your time today and really taking the time to share your insights on the financial advisory industry. You're most welcome. Yeah, so to all our listeners, um, I, now that you know how the financial advisory industry is 
in the next episode, we will talk about how you can find a guide that will guide you through the minefield of misinformation so that you can achieve a life that truly matters to you. It will be a very interesting episode, so don't forget to follow and subscribe if you haven't done so already. So with that, uh, once again, thank you, Evelyn, for the time today. And to all our listeners, we'll see you in the next episode. All analysis, views, opinions from interviews, recommendations and other information broadcasted, podcasted or published herein are provided for general information purposes only. Information expressed does not take into account any specific situation, particular needs or objectives and should not be construed as specific advice or recommendation. Information has been obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. Always consult with a qualified investment, legal or tax professional before taking any action. Provident Limited does not accept any liability or any loss whatsoever arising from any use of the information broadcasted, broadcasted or published herein. All contents and information contained herein may not be copied or reproduced in whole or in part by any means without prior written consent of Provident Limited. Thank you.